The AI landscape is constantly changing and it's really hard to keep up. So in this video, I want to cover 17 essential Python libraries that, in my opinion, every AI engineer should know. These are the exact libraries that we use to build all of our client projects at Datalumina right now. And if you understand most of these libraries, you'll set yourself up for a really great career as an AI engineer, something a lot of companies are hiring for right now. So let's dive in. And then real quick, just so we're all on the same page about what an AI engineer really is, in my opinion, because this role has really shifted over the past two years in terms of what the responsibilities are. And with AI engineering, I mean engineers focusing on integrating pre-trained models into applications or products rather than training a model from scratch, something that a machine learning engineer or a data scientist would focus on. All right, and the first library on the list is Pydentic. Now, Pydentic is the most widely used data validation library for Python. It's much more powerful than Python's standard data classes, and why it works so well for AI projects is that the data that is flowing through our systems is often very messy and unreliable. And Pydentic really enables you as an AI engineer to actually build AI systems rather than just simple wrappers around these APIs. Because by structuring and validating your data within your application, you can then use it to pass it down to other functions or next steps and control the flow of your application. All right, and then the second library following up on that is Pydentic Settings. So this is part of the Pydentic ecosystem, but it's actually a separate library that you can pip install. Now with Pydentic Settings, instead of using the base model that you use with regular Pydentic models, you can use the base settings model to specify and structure your settings. Now, I like to create separate files within my project. So for example, here you can see an example of an LLM config where I provide everything that I need in order to uh, instruct my LLMs. So I can make sure that I have the API key in here, which I will load and then up on runtime, if the API key is not available, it will throw an error because of the validation mechanisms that are implemented within these base settings. So overall, Pydentic settings really help me to one, structure all of my settings in a central place, and two, also validate all of the important information that my application needs. All right, and then the third library within the set apart is the python.env library. So this is going to ensure that you keep sensitive information like API keys or secrets out of your furniture control and keep them safe within your .env files. And like I've said, I really like to use this in combination with the Pydentic settings to load the environment variables and also validate them at the same time. All right, and then with the project setup out of the way, let's dive into some backend components, starting with the API. This is really going to act as the middle layer for your application, typically connecting the front end or user input with your backend logic. And we like to use Fast API for this. Now, Flask is another very popular Python library to build APIs, but we prefer Fast API because it's really straightforward, easy to learn, it just works, it's fast, and it integrates with Pydentic. And since Pydentic plays such a big role in our development workflow, it makes sense to use Fast API as well. So with Fast API, we can define endpoints which we can then send data to. And the data that is coming in can be specified using, like I've said, Pydentic models. So we make sure that the data that is flowing into our AI system is first validated by Pydentic so we know exactly what we're dealing with. So again, data validation, reliability, it plays a really big role within our design choices because AI applications and LLMs are very messy and chaotic and we wanna try our best to minimize that chaos or control that chaos as much as possible. All right, and then next up we have Salary, which is a Python library that you can use to build task queues, which you can use to distribute work across multiple threads or machines. Now this is useful when you're scaling up your application, for example, multiple users, and you wanna make sure that your endpoint remains available and active without, for example, tasks or processes taking a very long time to complete, which can sometimes be the case when you chain together multiple LLM calls. Sometimes these tasks, these processes take multiple seconds, sometimes even minutes, depending on how big your system is. And with Salary, we can ensure that our endpoint remains available by taking all of the incoming requests and putting them off to the task queue where they can work on a separate machine or thread, allowing our application to scale and be reliable. So typically what we do within our fast API endpoints is we just store the data in a database and then send it off to Salary and put it in a task queue. 
This ensures that the operation here at the endpoint level is very quick, very short, so it's non-blocking. And then we have separate logic for essentially picking up that task and then how to process it further in our application. Hey, and since there's so much demand for AI solutions right now, a lot of developers want to take on side projects next to their full-time job or even transition entirely to an independent career as a freelancer or agency owner. If that sounds like you, but you struggle to take the leap or struggle to land that first or that second client, you might want to check out the first link in the description. It's a video of me going over how my company can help you with this. In the video, you'll learn more about our program and also how to see if you qualify. So if that sounds like you, make sure to check that out. All right, then next, let's talk about data management and let's focus on databases first because your application needs to store data. Now, while there are plenty of databases available, Two common options that you can look into is either PostgreSQL for a SQL approach or MongoDB for a NoSQL approach. We actually like to use PostgreSQL for all our database needs. And the two Python libraries that uh, can really help with that is on the one hand, PsyCopG if you use Postgres, and on the other hand, PyMongo if you want to look into MongoDB. Both options that I believe you should be familiar with. And now, of course, your database, regardless of which one you use, is going to play a key role in storing all of the key data that your application relies on. So this could be the raw data in the form of events that are coming in, for example, to your endpoint. Then, of course, you have all the processing, maybe some intermediate steps and the final output that you send back to the user or your application. You probably want to store all of that in a database. All right, and then next up, we have SQL Alchemy. And this is really going to simplify all of the operations around working with your SQL database. So for example, in our case, this would be PostgreSQL. And SQL Alchemy just allows us to specify in pure Python all of the common operations that we would need when working with our database. So storing the data, retrieving the data, specifying our models. And SQL Alchemy is our Python library of choice for that. All right, and then following up on that, we have Alembic, which works together with SQL Alchemy to manage your database migrations. So this is a lightweight tool that you can use to define your database migrations in pure Python straight from your code base. So whenever, for example, you want to change the structure of your, your tables, add a column, remove a column, you can specify this from your code base and Alambic is going to help you perform that migration in the database itself without having to come up with complex SQL commands or opening your database at all to manage all of that. And this again just helps us to manage our entire project basically from within our Python code base, which is really convenient. All right, and then the last one in data management is the pandas library. So this is essentially your Excel tool, but then within pure Python. And me coming from a data science background, this is probably my most used library. And I really like it to uh, structure data in a more human readable way. So while this is more of a kind of like data science library, when you're building your, for example, your evaluation data sets or you're extracting information from unstructured data and you want to structure that, Pandas is a really powerful library that you can use to essentially structure it in rows and columns and perform these operations uh, on your data to manipulate that and then also view it again in a very human readable way. So also another library that I would recommend for you to dive into. All right, and then up next, let's talk about AI integration. And then of course, first of all, we have all the LLM model providers, right? Probably an open door, but for the sake of clarity and completeness, make sure you understand the OpenAI API, Anthropics API, look into Google's API. And finally, I can also recommend you to look into Olama, which is a, a unified interface that you can use to run and experiment with open source models. And now the fact that you're here watching these videos, you're probably already familiar with these, of course, but also make sure that you go beyond the simple quick starts, right? So really read through the API documentation. And for example, for OpenAI, look into function calling, structured output, look into the vision models, image generation. There is really a lot behind these APIs that you're probably not familiar with yet. And now because of these APIs from these model providers are really going to be at the core of your application, you really want to make sure that you fully understand all the ins and outs and the capabilities of that particular API. All right, and then following up on these model providers, we have the instructor library, which is currently my favorite way to work with these models and get structured output to build more reliable AI applications. And now while some of these model providers like OpenAI are also integrating their own ways to get structured output from the API, 
Instructor still has some upsides. For example, you have more complex data validation mechanisms. And I also like that it's model agnostic, which means that you can easily swap out different models. So Pydentic builds on top of the Pydentic library, which by now you know I'm a big fan of. And what you can do is you can specify Pydentic models using the base model. And here, for example, you can specify a name and an age. And we want to say the name should be a string and age should be an integer. And we can then create a chat completion, in this case using OpenAI, and the response model, uh, we can plug that in there. And essentially we'll ask the LLM model to give us data back in a specific format. And if it doesn't fit within that Pydentic model, Pydentic will throw an error and we can perform a retry. And now this really re increases the reliability of your application by basically being 100% confident that the data really that you get from those LLMs are exactly as how you specified them within your response models. So again, reliability, validation, core concepts, and as an AI engineer, I would recommend to always use structured output in your application. To me, there's just no reason to not use structured output. Up next, we have all of the frameworks out there that you can use to build applications with large language models. The most popular one being Langchain, probably followed by Llama Index. And now these are a bit of a controversial ones because you really have people that that love them and and people that that like that don't really like them. And why I put them on the list is that as an AI engineer, regardless of whether you like them, you should be familiar with them and at least have tried them because they cover a lot of the core concepts that you as an AI engineer should be familiar with. Combining different large language models, uh, working with embeddings and vector databases, building rack applications, managing prompts, all of those core concepts are integrated into these frameworks for you to then use in a few lines of code. And essentially what these frameworks do is they abstract away all of the core components that you need to build your application which then for you as a developer, make it very easy to get up and running in a few lines of code. But of course, there's also going to be a trade-off with that, right? Because you're going to be building upon abstractions that other developers made and designed based on their application and how they see it. And now this can introduce some problems where first of all, you might not fully understand what's going on behind the scenes. And second of all, there might be some things that are not implemented within the framework and with that, it can get really messy. In the past, I've run into issues when using Langchain where I had to dig five layers deep into some classes to figure out why I couldn't implement something. And this got messy real quickly. So for us right now, we don't use any of these frameworks and build everything from scratch depending on the project that we're working on. So we fully understand our complete project. But again, I put these frameworks in here because as an AI engineer, you should be familiar with them because maybe some clients or teams that you're working with do use these tools and you can get a lot of great inspiration from that, maybe even build entire applications. But just out of all of the companies and clients we've talked to, no one is using these frameworks in production systems. So just so you know that, that's just my observation. All right, and then next let's talk about vector databases, which play a key role in most AI applications to store and retrieve the right context at the right time through a process which is called retrieval augmented generation. Now, while you can do more with vector databases, this is probably right now the most common use case and why you wanna use vector databases. There are a handful of options out there. So again, I'm going to provide you with some options, but you should at least be familiar with most of these, understand the pros and cons, and then dive into the one that makes the most sense for your use case. So first off, we have Pinecone, which is a really popular one. Then we have Wii V8, Quadrant is another one. And also the one that we actually like to use is PG Factor Scale, which is actually an extension for uh, Postgres that you can use to uh, store vector embeddings and perform similarity search straight into Postgres. I did an entire video series on this. Uh, we like to use this because it simplifies our workflow because we just can use one database. And otherwise, for example, if you use one of these other options, you probably also need another database to store your regular application data. All of these databases, vector databases, uh, have similar, somewhat similar functionalities and Python SDKs that you can work with. So make sure to familiarize yourself with all of these vector databases and pick the one that best suits your project. All right, and then up next, let's talk about observability and monitoring. Again, another category where there are multiple options that you can pick from, but you should at least be familiar with one of them. 
And these are going to play a crucial role in maintaining and debugging your application. So essentially what these platforms do, which are all available also through Python libraries, is for example here with Langfuse, you can really track all of your LLM calls and keep track of key metadata. So what was the prompt? What was the data? What was the output? What was the latency? What was the cost? Everything that you want to know about your interactions with these large language models can be traced in these platforms. Now, they all work pretty similar. There are, of course, pros and cons. Uh, we like to use Langfuse, so it's an open source platform. And by the way, you can also self-host all of these, but another common one is Langsmith. So multiple options, but really crucial to at least have one of them integrated with your LLM application to track everything. All right, so by now we already covered a really complete stack to build event-driven AI applications and also make sure that they are reliable and robust. Now let's get into the final three libraries that I wanna cover that can help you with some more specialized tasks within your AI systems. And the first one is DSPy. Now this is definitely a library that I want to do more with. So the whole paradigm that they're introducing here is programming, not prompting. So DSPy is a library that allows you to iterate fast on building modular AI systems by optimizing prompts and weights. So instead of you as the AI engineer, as the prompter coming up with everything, DSPy offers you frameworks to essentially start with basic prompts and then let the AI over time figure out what the best prompt is for the problem that you're trying to solve. And I think this is a paradigm that heading into the future, heading into this more AI integrated uh, future that we're going towards, this is going to be a core part because prompting right now to me still feels pretty random because there are so many ways to tackle a problem. And is this the right approach? Can it be better? Can I do it with fewer tokens? All of these questions are taking up so much time when you're trying to do this manually. And if there is a good framework and setup that you can do to iterate over this and essentially let AI figure out the best prompt, then that is going to be really helpful. And DSPy is, I believe, the first one of its kind to do something like that. So definitely one that you can look into. It's definitely more of an advanced library that can work really well when you're already a little bit deeper into a project, for example, and you want to increase the performance, tweak the performance by optimizing your prompts. All right, and then the second category in these final tools are ways to extract information from documents or PDFs. And there are a couple of options here, and this typically requires some experimentation based on the type of data that you're working with. But one popular library for this is PyMu PDF, which allows you to extract information from PDFs. You can also try Py2 PDF. So these will have different results, again, depending on the data that you're using. We've also found that for some use cases, it works better to actually use a service from Amazon, like Amazon Textract or Azure uh, Document Intelligence, for example, where you need a little bit more power. Now, these are open source and you can integrate them direct directly into your uh, project in pure Python. These are services that you uh, essentially use through an API and there's also a cost associated with that. And there are so many great use cases out there right now for companies where they're sitting on lots of unstructured data in the form of Word documents and PDFs. And these tools are really going to help you extract all of that information and then feed it to your AI system. All right, and the final one on the list is Jinja. So Jinja is a templating engine for Python that you can use to programmatically fill in templates with data. And Jinja is really cool for building dynamic prompts. And this is, I think, something you'll see more AI engineers using in the future. So here's an article from Jason Liu, creating of the instructor library, also explaining why he thinks using Jinja uh, within the instructor library is the right choice. And it mainly has to do with Jinja's formatting capabilities, validation, versioning and, and logging, and more specifically also, like I said, creating dynamic prompts. So within our projects, we actually like to store our prompts using Jinja templates where we can introduce some of the logic that we just covered. And we then have a simple prompt manager class to manage all of this and load it into our application. All right, and those are all of the Python libraries that, in my opinion, every AI engineer should know right now. Now, throughout this video, you saw me walking through examples from this project, which is our generative AI launchpad. So we made that entire project available as a repository plus a course that's going to help AI engineers to build and deploy generative AI applications faster. So it has everything you need from all of the 
infrastructure, the components, all the way with the instructions to then deploy this on a server. So if you're interested in this, make sure to check out the link in the description. You'll get the entire project that you see over here, plus a course on how to get started and start building your own applications. All right, and then that's it for this video. Now, if you found it helpful, please leave a like and also consider subscribing if you wanna learn more about AI engineering. And then make sure to check out this video next. It's a video of me going over the entire process that we use inside Datalumina, my company, to find, build, and deliver generative AI projects.